Hello, and welcome to day two of the MDF 2021 virtual conference. I am Dr. Tanya Stevenson, the CEO at MDF, and I am delighted you could join us for our second day of our conference. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome. We have a fantastic day ahead. Yesterday, we heard from incredible DM experts across all conference tracks, as well as three drug companies who have launched clinical trials for myotonic dystrophy, with many others hoping to launch in the next 12 to 18 months. Today at the conference, we will have a clinical trials readiness workshop to help us all learn a little bit more about why these clinical trials are important, what they really are, and what we can do to prepare to participate. Our advocacy workshop is also today, if you wanna learn a little more about International Myotonic Dystrophy Awareness Day, and don't forget, the research posters are open for a limited time today. I am absolutely thrilled to say that we are hosting not one, not two, but three Stump the Expert sessions today for DM1, DM2, and for health insurance. So if you have a question you want answered, please bring those tough questions and join us for one of these sessions at two o'clock Pacific today. Note that our community panels are back this year, and please don't forget to come bust a move at our closing dance party tonight. In just a minute, we will hear from our MDF founding executive director, Lisa Harvey Duran, with the special presentation of the third annual Kayla Vidic Memorial Award for Outstanding Community Advocate. She is followed by amazing DM activists and families working to raise awareness eliminate the stigma of living with a rare disease, and move the needle on quality of life for families living with DM. I would like to thank these courageous community members for having strength to share their stories and their personal struggles, as well as how they are trying to live their absolute best lives, raise awareness about the disease, and turn difficult situations into learning opportunities that ultimately help to improve the lives of other families with DM. For now, I would like to take one moment to recognize that today is September 11th, 2021, exactly 20 years since the World Trade Center Twin Towers fell and thousands of lives were lost. I was living in Manhattan on 9-11 and know too well the toll that this took on millions of people, many of whom are still healing. On this 20th anniversary, I'd like to take this moment to honor those we lost on 9-11 and in the Middle East over the last two decades. Our thoughts are with their families and loved ones today. And this morning is really about inspiration. We must take time to recognize the people who go above and beyond, people who advocate for and with us inspire us, and find strength even in the most challenging of times. MDF has the great fortune of seeing and hearing from many of these families and individuals throughout our extended community on a regular basis. And we wanna be sure that you have a chance to hear from a few of them as well. So it is my great privilege to introduce you to the incredible founding executive director of MDF, Lisa Harvey Duran who will be granting the third annual Kayla Vidic Memorial Award for Outstanding Community Advocate. Welcome, Lisa. My name is Lisa Harvey Duran, and I'm honored to have been the founding executive director of the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation. My daughter, Kayla Michelle Vidic, was born in July of 2005, eight weeks early and fighting for her life. That's the day I became her advocate, and later a staunch advocate for the community of families living with myotonic dystrophy. I'm here in Kayla's room, share a little bit about Kayla and who she was and some of her favorite things. It's hard to be here without her, but I'm glad to be here. Kayla was diagnosed with severe congenital myotonic dystrophy with over 2,500 CTG repeats and struggled just to breathe and eat in her early years. We lived day to day battling the challenges that congenital DM threw her way, and there were many challenges. 
When Kayla was three days old, I started blogging about her, her journey and began finding other families living with myotonic dystrophy. It was shocking how little medical information was available to families. And what we did find was very grim. <clears throat> Kayla was my motivation in joining in on the efforts to help create the MDF. Together, we helped families to connect and build the amazing community that we have today. My sweet, funny, beautiful girl has taught me so much about life. She's still teaching me today. I could called Kayla my can-do girl. She never set out to be a DM warrior. And she never stopped and said, what limits am I breaking today? Kayla just did it. She showed us what happens if you just give someone a chance. Just by the virtue of who she was, she challenged narrow-minded notions about disability, human value, inclusion, and acceptance because she was constantly pushing the boundaries of possibility. She dismantled preconceived ideas about ability, even often surprising experts. In Kayla's short journey, she made a huge impact around the world. Her story was told on our local MDA telethon for three years, starting when she was one years old. By the time she was four, we shared her story in the National MDA Jerry Lewis telethon, where she helped millions of people understand the challenges that myotonic dystrophy creates in a family. Kayla's story has been continued to be told by numerous media outlets over the years. When she was eight, we were invited to Washington, D.C. to testify at a congressional hearing for the renewal of the MD Care Act. And I'm happy to tell you that it was unanimously passed. Kayla also participated with our family for over six years for the Stanford Medical School Roadshow. We were invited to help teach the new Stanford medical students in their first week of medical school about myotonic dystrophy, as well as teaching them about compassion and empathy for patients in general. We continued this program for the past three years, but sadly without Kayla. Kayla's life was unexpectedly cut short on April 9, 2019, at the age of 13 years and eight months. She had heart complications related to myotonic dystrophy and passed away in her sleep in this room here. Kayla participated in research studies on congenital myotonic dystrophy for over five years, but she gave the ultimate gift to this community by donating her body to myotonic dystrophy researchers who will continue to learn and eventually treat and cure this disorder. To learn more about Kayla's journey, go to cureforkayla.com. Now, why I'm really here today is to present the third annual Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation's Kayla Vidic Memorial Award for Outstanding Community Advocate. This award was created to honor Kayla's lifetime of advocacy and to honor advocates in this community. The young lady that was selected for this year's award is living with juvenile onset myotonic dystrophy. She was diagnosed around 11 and is now 20 years old. She lives in a small town called Astorville in Ontario, Canada with her parents. Her father has DM as well as her younger brother, a friend sent her the information about the International Myotonic Dystrophy Awareness Day logo contest that we just had. She loves art and decided to take on the challenge. She was really excited at the idea of being able to do a logo for a disease that affects her. It gave her a chance to put a little extra meaning behind it. She really enjoys answering questions that people have in her life about myotonic dystrophy. And she's found that by being open, people treat her well and try to help her when she needs it. I love her attitude. She was interviewed by her local media outlet, North Bay Nugget, in May of this year and recognized as a top five finalist for the logo contest. I'm so pleased to award the Kayla Vinick Third Annual Memorial Award for Outstanding Community Adv Advocate to Alexandra LeBoff. Way to go, Alex. You did an amazing job creating the logo and your design is gonna reach so many people around the world. We are so proud of you. So now let me introduce Alex. Hi, 
I'm so happy to be uh, receiving the Kayla Vidic Award. It is really an honor. Thank you so much to Lisa and to the MDF. Um, I read a little bit about Kayla in her article and she sounds like a very wonderful person. She reminds me a bit of myself at that age. And if I would have had the chance, I would have loved to meet her. She sounds like a really great person. Uh, well, I think it's really important just because, again, it's a very rare disease. Not a lot of people know about it. When I talk about it, usually they've never even heard of it. They never even knew it existed. So just raising awareness helps not just the community, uh, it helps other families. It also helps doctors and specialists just know that there's that we're all together and Raising awareness could also help some diagnosis in some cases for people that just don't know why either they're made this way or what's wrong with them. In my experience, it took us maybe like two years of seeing specialists and doctors just to figure out what was going on. Raising awareness is I think it's really helpful for, doc for the doctors and the nurses and the specialists because I feel like you can always learn more and the more people you diagnose or you work with and the more that you find maybe different symptoms, different way to help it, what some people do that works for them, which medication they use and with you, when you wear, raise awareness, I feel like more people will come up and ask about it and it'll just become bigger and bigger more people will learn about it uh we'll find more solutions and we'll find we'll, we'll find solutions to some problems that maybe today we don't know how to fix or just deal with i i learned about it through a friend who tagged me in a post on facebook and she suggested that I should put in an entry for the contest because she knew about how I had loved to draw and create. And I thought that, I thought that was a great idea. Um, and being able to do a logo and be affected by the, by myotonic dystrophy uh, gave me the chance to put a little bit more meaning behind it and hopefully to show other people Hopefully they were they uh, were able to see the meaning, and if not, I'll be able to talk about that. Um, and it's just something that I was able to do and use what I know and what I love to do to make it really great. <laughs> well, my logo is basically it's a hand that's in a fist that's holding a green ribbon which I have learned that is our color for most of the dystrophy our color is green so I really wanted to put that in there and the hand represents the hand stiffening and staying in fists if you squeeze them and also uh, the fist pointed upwards is also a symbol of strength which I feel like this community really does need strength to be able to stay stay um, strong and advocate and on the wrist there's a little heart that means passion and community and being able to just have the ribbon in a circle is kind of like just showing that it keeps it'll keep growing and we're strong and we don't break easily <laughs> Art has always been a really big part of who I am with my creativity. I used to, I'm I was a dancer. I started when I was three. I did competitive dancing, which really helped with strength and staying strong. Uh, it's also with drawing, and I also play a little bit of ukulele, and that has actually really helped me with keeping my hands strong, which is 
One of the things that I have the most trouble with is my hands. They stiffen up and get sore very easily. So art is a way to keep myself strong and also to create an outlet for when I'm stressed or I just need to some kind of stress relief. I draw or I play or I dance or something and it just it's a way that I can use something I love to keep me healthy. I learned about myotonic dystrophy nine years ago at the age of 11. And the first diagnosis was given to my father. And then after his diagnosis, everybody else got tested and we found out that it ran in the family. Um, myotonic dystrophy affects my life just because of the diagnosis and it also doesn't affect just me, it also affects my family and my loved ones and it always, I guess we always kind of had, we were always different, we never really had an explanation for it before the diagnosis, um, but when we see the specialists, it's really at the family thing and I really like that we can go through it together so nobody's alone. Uh, with school I really have to advocate for myself. Nobody can really figure out what that it's there when you just look at me. It's kind of like an invisible disease um, and I really have to explain to my peers and to teachers, co-workers, I have to explain to them what is myotonic dystrophy and how it affects me in my day-to-day -day life. And sometimes I find it a little hard just because it's very rare and it's not the easiest to explain. Uh, but I find ways to try to do everything everybody else does. I mean, modify a little bit just so I can do it with um, so I can do it easily and I don't have too much trouble with it. Uh, but I've, I've gone pretty good at that. Well, usually I just explain that I have weaker muscles and it might take a little bit more effort for me to do things that other people can do easily. I tell them that I may experience pain in my hands if I have to like open a really heavy door or lift up a big box. And I also tell them that my attention span and my, my focus is also a little off and that sometimes you will have to remind me to make sure I'm actually listening to what they're saying in case I zone off and I do tell them Sometimes they ask questions, they're like, oh, is it progressive? And I do answer that truthfully. Um, but most of the time, people are really accepting and they tend to understand pretty well. It's just my muscles are weaker and I have trouble with muscle mass and they stiffen up really easily. I will tell them that it's like, it's not as bad as it sounds. Like some people, they get a diagnosis and they just completely break down because they don't know what to do. But you can, there's tons and tons of things where they can get help from. They can get it from foundations and communities and groups that really focus on being able to uh, help them adapt and I would also like do your research, make sure you really know what the future could look like and what your present looks like. And also meet with people. I've met two really great friends that also have muscular dystrophy that I've made through networks and the walk for muscular dystrophy we have here in North Bay that is it's really helped me just because we understand each other and it's just really connect with other people. It can really help even though it seems like, it seems like it won't help, like it's just somebody else, but I feel like connecting with people that 
our like you is really good for, for the soul. <laughs>I like to tell them that it's not something that makes yes I'm different because of it but don't treat me any differently I don't want pity I don't want sympathy I really don't want anybody to pity me because of this I want to be treated as as an equal I don't think that this limits me at all even though sometimes with something it does it limits me just a little bit but I can modify it and make it work for me. So I just think that whenever I tell somebody about it, I do have to explain to them, don't treat me any differently. I'm just like anybody else. It's just that I have a little a harder time with some things and I might need a little bit of help. Uh, well, I would like to say that if anybody is affected with it, don't be scared to talk about it. That is something I've had trouble with. I had trouble trusting people with this kind of information, scared that they'd distance themselves or that they would, again, treat me differently. But talk about it, connect with people, and just don't be scared. Don't limit yourself. I live in Astorville, which is a town in Ontario in Canada. And uh, I'm Julie LaBeouf. Um, I'm Michelle's wife, Alexandra's mother, and I also reside in Astorville, Ontario, Canada. So I was first diagnosed about 10 years ago. Um, following that diagnosis, we had our kids tested uh, and our daughter Alexandra and son Nicholas uh, tested positive. Um, that led my siblings to get tested. Um, I have two siblings, they both were confirmed with myotonic dystrophy uh, as well as my nephew. And just to add to that, um, Michelle had symptoms. Now that we look back, he's always had symptoms, extreme fatigue, muscle aches, um, all kinds of different odds and ends that didn't make sense. And saw many doctors and finally a neurologist in the in Ontario, um, we, we, also, we always have to drive. We, we live in a very small community, so we're driving all over. So finally, the neurologist diagnosed Michelle, and it seems like all the pieces fell into place with this diagnosis. Um, even Alexandra, um, she's always had symptoms from a very young age that could not be explained. And in some way, with the new diagnosis, um, we were able to plan and uh, we were able to take care of the kids and take care of Michelle's health thanks to this diagnosis. That's a tough question. <laughs> um, getting the diagnosis um, was almost a bit of a relief. Um, finding out that all the different symptoms I was having, um, there was a reason for them. I wasn't just lazy. Um, and it's that being a parent at the same time, initially there's a lot of guilt because it came from me. Um, so you have to learn to deal with that and that I didn't do anything wrong. Um, having it yourself also it gives a lot of empathy to um, dealing with the kids' symptoms. Um, I know they're not lazy, um, and 
when they forget things or um, have trouble in school or just a lack of focus, I know exactly where they're coming from because I progressively deal with the same thing. They were first diagnosed. I thought we could do it all on our own. We did a bit of reading, research, and we thought, we're okay, we can do this. What I've learned along the way is that we need that community. Um, it takes a village. And I've learned to reach out. I've learned that I can't do it all by myself. It's important not to isolate and um, to be positive, that's extremely important for my family. Um, like Alex mentioned, there's no limitations. We do everything in a modified kind of way. Um, we seize the day, we live for the moment, and that's really how we live our life. At first, I didn't fully appreciate what she was applying for or submitting. Um, and I assumed being an international, uh, my little girl from Astorville wasn't going to win the worldwide design competition, but I was excited about it. I really liked her logo and what it represented. Um, like, it, it's perfect because it's, it's everything about myotonic dystrophy is in that logo. The strength, the the fist not being able to open. Um, so obviously we we voted for it, and uh, just I, when she won, I just I got on my phone and told everyone I knew that she had won, and I was uh, very proud. Yeah, um, we like to look at the kids' strengths and try to give them opportunities with their strengths and their talents. Like we're always looking for opportunities. So when uh, I had also seen that the, on Facebook, this and I, I talked to Alex and, I, and she wanted to, and I thought, oh my God, you'd be so great, great at this, start, start drawing. So we chatted a bit and she came up with a few designs and a great friend of the family helped her um, because she doesn't have all the knowledge with the computer skills. So she kind of took her design, her picture and helped her um, do the, the digital, copy of it and just like Michelle mentioned we just it was a shot and like we, we didn't think anything would come out of this it's just you know but either way we figured she's a winner we were going to use the logo in our own way just doing this just just uh, creating this logo in our eyes she was already a winner but to actually win this international competition every time I see her logo on Facebook or <laughs> on the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation website, it just, it takes my breath away. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's important from like a global perspective of all the people I come into contact with, because to be honest, I'm tired of explaining it. Um, and I don't want, I don't hold myself out as being any different. Um, the handicap sticker I have on my truck, for example, is usually hidden in the glove compartment unless I need it. Um, people that are close to me, I want, I, I want them to understand, uh, if I, if I need to lie down or, um, if I seem like I don't care for my facial expressions, it's not because I don't care. It's because I can't show it. Uh, from a professional point of view, um, when we were, when I was first diagnosed, the first medical people we talked to told us to get our will ready, don't tell our kids, and be prepared to die. Um, that was drastically different from the second professionals we saw. Um, we had to explain it to our family doctor. Um, 
it would be nice to like we're in the position where we have to be the experts and we have to educate the medical professionals we deal with aside from uh, the specialist but even there um, we've seen two specialists and they're great and they, they have certain things they focus on uh, and there's certain other things that they have no idea about that we have to know everything about it so raising awareness would just make it would make life easier um, the other thing I would think is there's likely a lot of undiagnosed people because there's such a variety of symptoms um, someone might get diagnosed with just heart problems and miss the rest of it um, so a lot like students who have it who are not diagnosed would often get left uh, by the wayside they'd fall through the cracks well, that kid's just lazy or that kid just doesn't want to focus um, or he doesn't care um, so if, if everyone knew more I think it would help with a proper diagnosis for a lot of people and for people who are diagnosed it would help them uh, not having to re-explain things and getting a proper treatment support yeah and for me um, fundraising and the whole awareness piece is my way of making a difference it's my way of having hope uh, for a cure someday. Um, the other uh, piece of fundraising and awareness is we do this as a family. Uh, the kids are involved. It gives them a voice and um, they feel like they're contributing and they can make a difference. Most importantly, I would say that myotonic dystrophy will always be part of your life, but it is not your life. Uh, and to not to let uh, that diagnosis define you um, any more than any other illness. Um, you have a cold, but you are not a cold. You have myotonic dystrophy, but that is not you. Um, and to really seek out you need to do your research but don't google it because it'll just depress you <laughs> um you need to, to reach out to people who know which would be uh muscular dystrophy canada myotonic dystrophy foundation uh the people who really understand uh what's going on um and uh i guess being a progressive disease, um, accept the way you are today and how strong you are today and do everything that you can. Uh, enjoy your life, live every day like, you, like it's your last. Um, really relish in who you are and what you can do. And don't let it stop you because the more you do, the longer it will take before that progression gets ended. As a caregiver, to not lose sight of the family, every member of the family. Um, so we're a family of five, three have myotonic dystrophy, but I also do have a daughter who doesn't have myotonic dystrophy and she has her place in that too. And she lives with guilt. Um, she's also through some relief, but she's got her own emotions related to this disease. So to not, and to not forget every person in this family including yourself as a caregiver um, you have to make time as hard as it is for yourself um, and to reach out you can't do this alone and there's wonderful people out there uh, to surround yourself with friends family if you can um, the myotonic dystrophy foundation has been great the toolkits have been wonderful um, just the information, the webinars, just it, that tip for me, that would have been the starting point. It took me three years to actually do the research and, and to find it, but to really, that should have been my number one stop. Um, in our region, we have Muscular Dystrophy Canada that's been wonderful to us. So it's to reach out 
and to not isolate yourself and just surround and accept help. If, if you ask, people will be there. And um, just to, like Michelle mentioned, just live, live for the day and try not to focus on the future too much because you can't control that. You can only control at the present moment. Stay strong and have hope. Um, there, there's great research going on. Um, it is a, a genetic condition. And as far as I know, we can't change the genetics, but there's a very exciting research and, and testing going on right now uh, that could uh, eliminate most of the, if not all, of the, the symptoms. And uh, there's strength in numbers. It's I think it's by working together that we can make a difference. Um, and to not forget, um, as adults, as we have a voice, but the children also have a voice. So I'm very proud of Alexandra, and and we have to take time and listen to the youth also. They have a lot to contribute. We are the LaBeffs. Have a wonderful conference. Hi, my name is Teresa Buffoni. I live in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. And since 2012, I have been an advocate for myotonic muscular dystrophy. My husband uh, had surgery on two separate occasions lengthy surgeries and the first time he was given general anesthesia after uh, the surgery went well but afterwards in the recoup room he had to be resuscitated he was given general anesthesia and he was he was resuscitated and put on a respirator in ICU for 10 days he had a, a subsequent surgery about four years later, and I had told the surgeon, I said, don't use general anesthesia because uh, it's, it, it's not good for my tonic patients. Lo and behold, after the surgery took place, I was called once again into the um, waiting room and the surgeon came in and he said to me, Mrs. Pony, the same thing happened, I'm sorry. I was so mad. I said, how could this have happened? Once again, he was uh, resuscitated, put in uh, on a respirator, and again, over 10 days in the IC unit. Then when my son had to have surgery, I made sure that the anesthesia guidelines were with the surgeon, and I impressed upon them what my husband had gone through. So I knew that this was problematic for my tonic patients. And at this time, I started to attend some of the support group um, for muscular dystrophy. And there was a, a family member and she said to me that her daughter had surgery. Actually, she had given birth and um, what happened was that she was given general anesthesia at the, surger, at the surgery. The birth was a little bit difficult. And she was, uh, ex she experienced a lot of difficulties get, getting out of the anesthesia. So I made the connection. I said, well, it can't be just my husband. So this is definitely an issue. So I had uh, communicated with the CEO of the Ottawa Hospital on a previous occasion um, and I asked him, I said, can you do something for me? Can you make sure that these guidelines get distributed 
in your hospital uh, because of the effects it had, it had on my husband and on my son. So he wrote back to me and he said, yes. Now the reason I think I got a, a clear yes was because by training, he by professional training, he was an anesthesiologist. So he understood the difficulty that a myotonic dystrophy patient would have when given general anesthesia. So from that, I, it just uh, mushroomed, you know, the, uh, I was encouraged by this kind of action. I mean, I asked him if he could send it out to the, all the hospitals in Ottawa. He responded, yes, he had done so. So I said, well, I got to take this a step further. I got to take it to the, all hospitals across Canada. Anyway, I wrote again letters to uh, provincial ministers of health and I said, please make sure that these are distributed. I even went as far as communicating with um, the anesthesio at an anesthesiology conference in Toronto that year. I said, can you make sure that this is given or put on the as a handout for people to to uh, obtain or to take home with them. So I, you know, I did as much as I could, uh, but there was still a lot more to be done. So that was my first project and I was encouraged by that. Well, the EPIC project which is basically uh, hospital electronic records. Uh, it's a system that enables electronic uh, records uh, to be accessed by physicians, etc. The idea first came to mind in 2015 when my son was hospitalized for numerous times for his pseudo bowel obstructions. I, fear, I feared that if I did not accompany him to the hospital emergency, all the surgeons wanted to do was to perform surgery at the first sight of him, and that's not what I wanted. So I wanted a note on his hospital med medical chart to indicate that he had myotonic dystrophy, anesthesia caution, and his pseudo bowel obstruction was to be conservatively managed because nobody actually really knew. Even in Florida, he had one of these obstructions in Florida and admitted in one of the hospitals in Florida. And the doctors there didn't know what my tonic was or how to treat it. So I, I was, I was in a bind, you know, he, he was in a terrible situation. Luckily, I communicated with Dr. John Day and he gave me advice. So from there on in, he recuperated and he was treated conservatively. So basically, I by that time, I knew more than what some of the doctors knew about myotonic dystrophy. So in 2019, several years later, I met another DM family in Ottawa. I mentioned the idea to him uh, as he was an IT management specialist at the Ottawa hospital. So when I mentioned to him this idea, he immediately said, yes, it was a doable project and he would bring it to senior management for consideration and action. It took time, but the idea was accepted and changes were made to the hospital's EPIC system. So the EPIC system enables the identification of a patient's mitonic dystrophy, identifies cautious use of anesthesia and certain drugs, and it also makes a link so that a doctor can go to the care guidelines, the consensus care guidelines for myotonic dystrophy. So it was all encompassing that 
the doctors didn't have to leave their little uh, iPad. They had all the information right there in front of them. So this came into play in the spring of this year. If this proves successful in the Ottawa hospital, because the, obviously there was a training involved, etc., it will be promoted in other hospitals in Canada who have electronic records. Well, first of all, I don't think I'm a great advocate. What I'm doing is highlighting uh, to the system, to the organizations where some of these uh, um, deficiencies um, occur. And I bring forth um, suggestions on how to make things better. Um, I, I tend to give out a, a propose an idea and then change, stay back and see how how things or how what the reaction is to my idea or proposal. Whereas before I would have gone in like a bull in a china shop, but now I'm a little bit more cautious. I think about uh, a little bit more what I'm about to say and how I have to say it and, and in order to get cooperation. So you learn uh, how to gauge uh, your audience or you know the person you want to meet with. Basically, find out all you can about them by their organization, about them, what, what, what are they responsible for? And then highlight, well, if you're responsible for this particular aspect, then we fit right in there. So you're trying to convince them and see the light that um, there are deficiencies in the healthcare system, no matter where. So you try to make the best and make positive suggestions. Yeah, you, you can't change the world, but you can change tiny bits of, of, I look at it as being a jigsaw puzzle. You know, you can't create the, or put all the pieces together in one shot. You have to think about it, then you have to plan and strategize. Well, if, if you do this, then you, you have to do, uh, you know, something else. Or you have, if you give up one thing, you can, you can only give up so many things or so many issues. But the ones that are more important are the life and death issues, you know, the care. Uh, if, if they're, for instance, um, myotonic dystrophy affects people in different ways. And I, the issues that my husband had and my son had were totally different. My son had more critical ones and my daughter yet had fewer. So, what you're trying to do is just pick on those particular issues that are really important. For instance, the anesthesia guidelines. It's because I went through that, that scenario that I was able to make an impact and convince the people. And also there was a little bit of luck in the fact that the person I had approached was by profession and an anesthesiologist, so he knew exactly where I was coming from. So yeah, I, I know specifically uh, what issues to take uh, and bring forward. Um, I, when, when there were cases, when there were issues with my son, you know, as he also had uh, cardiac issues, um, you know, I brought home from the conference um, a lot of information that Dr. Grohl had presented at one of the conferences. So I pinpointed on, on exactly the video, uh, the time frame on the video that, he sh that the cardiologist should be looking at. And I said to him, I said, we need to have a look at this particular section of the video, which says that, uh, you know, people who have myotonic dystrophy, you should be looking at the electrical conduction system and not 
um, give them a, a 24 hour monitor, but a 48 hour monitor. So I knew, you know, I had backing, scientific backing from what I'd heard at the conference. So it made a lot of sense when someone heard me say that, and then I had given them proof. And at the same time, you know, uh, at the conference, we'd heard, I'd heard that, you know, a pacemaker should be considered when the marker is at three rather than the normal four, because you want to have a better outcome for the myotonic patient. So it was, you know, things that happened to me personally that I, was able then to outlay and and explain and it made sense and i had given them proof the cardiologist proof that this is exactly what myotonic dystrophy does to to card to to myotonic patients isn't teresa incredible MDF is inspired not only by Alexandra's and the LeBeau family's drive to raise awareness in their local community, but also by Teresa's resiliency and ability to keep fighting, saving lives, and maximizing the health of the DM community. Teresa helped change an entire hospital system simply by sharing her ideas and the realities of myotonic dystrophy. She felt people could take actionable steps and ask them to do so. She's improving care and ultimately health outcomes on a regional level. We hope this will serve as a model for other hospital systems to follow. Now, it is my great privilege to introduce a family who has been raising awareness about DM for many years. Dr. Glenn Wiggins has been sharing about myotonic dystrophy with medical students in Georgia so that they may learn more about the disease beyond what is in their textbooks and so they'll be more likely to recognize the symptoms of the disease and diagnose as early as possible. Angie and Paul Wiggins, Dr. Wiggins' son, have also been raising awareness in different ways, both large and small scale. Last year, Angie developed a widespread awareness campaign she dubbed the Socks On Challenge, which also doubled as a fundraiser for MDF, raising over $50,000. Angie, who won MDF's Above and Beyond Award last year, included in their awareness campaign outreach to different community organizations, middle and high schools, medical schools. We've asked them to share their inspirational journey today. My name is Paul Wiggins. I live in Athens, Georgia with my wife and son. I'm Angie Wiggins. And I'm Dr. Glenn Wiggins, uh, Paul's father. Um, I was officially diagnosed with my time dystrophy at about age 30. We were going through uh, physicals, my wife and I, to um, for the adoption process, um, going through a physical with my general practitioner, I mentioned that I had some hand stiffness and weakness, and he referred me to a neurologist, and he diagnosed me immediately. This was, like I said, age 30, but I've had other symptoms prior to that. At age 26, um, when Angie and I have been married, for six months, I had cardiac problems where I ended up having a defibrillator implanted. Um, I have pulmonary issues, sleep apnea, um, severe GI issues, um, muscle weakness throughout the body, and um, just general everyday activities that you take for granted. I have to try to adapt um, to those. And there's just some things I physically cannot do. One of those being putting on socks. Um, 
As Paul mentioned, his disease affects every aspect of our lives. We have to think about everything before we plan to do. And every day he needs care and it's a near constant thing. And so it has, it's just been all encompassing for us. And not only affecting uh, Paul, Angie and Alex, but it also affects um, my wife and I who live in town and try to take care of her and supply as much help to Paul and Angie as we can. And in addition, our two other sons also have myotonic dystrophy and uh, differing degrees. So Socks On Challenge uh, is an idea I came up with last year. I was trying to think of a way that I could support Paul and support other people who have been diagnosed with myotonic dystrophy. I wanted other, it's a very uncommon disease and most people haven't heard of it. They confuse it with MS a lot, I've noticed. And so I wanted people to, to know the disease, to understand it, to hear uh, personal stories about it and just to, to be thinking about it so that they could understand more of what we go through and what other people go through. And I also wanted maybe, you know, if someone's heard of myotonic dystrophy and then they know somebody who has the symptoms, maybe it would lead to a quicker diagnosis. So I came up with Slots on Challenge because I just thought it would be a good way to spread the word in the community about myotonic dystrophy and at the same time help patients with myotonic dystrophy. And so what we did was we challenged people to put on crazy socks and wear them and we made a little, I made a little dance video with some of my friends and we put that on social media and also I showed it at the school where I work and the kids really got into it and they wanted to wear crazy socks as well and people shared and they spread the word and before I knew it the campaign had just kind of blown up and there was so much support and it was so much fun to watch how people in our community got behind us and wanted to support us. We raised, um, we raised over up $52,000 plus um, with the sock sales and mainly just donations um, from friends of my parents, friends of ours, co-workers of um, Angie and just people from the community that wanted to support us. One other thing that Angie mentioned was uh, education of the public, which certainly this campaign has, has done a lot, but uh, Paul and I have also taken on a challenge to try and educate the medical profession. And we've been doing that for seven or eight years, giving a lecture to first year medical students uh, at the Athens campus of Medical College of Georgia. And uh, first year students um, have gotten a, a lecture about myotonic dystrophy and Paul has been there to tell his story and to answer questions. It's not commonly taught in medical school, uh, even though it's frequency is probably about one in 2000 and it is the most common form of, of adult muscular dystrophy. The other reason for, for doing this um, is to try and decrease the time that it takes to make a diagnosis. The ad, average time span from when a patient with myotonic dystrophy first presents to a physician and is finally diagnosed is generally seven to eight years, which is a very stressful time for the patient and the family. Uh, and the other thing is uh, myotonic dystrophy has many uh, multi-systemic uh, presentations um, and they present initially at birth with a congenital form of myotonic dysphy to a neonatologist 
or to a pediatrician with a juvenile onset and, and learning difficulties, or as an adult, as what Paul uh, presented. And they present to primary care or to subspecialists, such as a cardiologist, gastroenterologist, pulmonologist, neurologist, obviously. And it's most important that the patient and family member educate themselves about myotonic dystrophy in order to help educating the treat, treating physicians because most physicians do not are not aware of myotonic dystrophy. And uh, it's incumbent upon us as caregivers to make them aware of it and make them aware of the problems of this disease. And the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation has done an excellent job of uh, publishing guidelines regarding diagnosis, uh, management, and treatment of the disease. I think for us, uh, as a family who struggles with myotonic dystrophy every day, raising awareness was really important in our community because like I said, we wanted people to understand our experience and hear about it. We are hoping maybe to minimize the time of between onset and diagnosis for other families. And then we have a son who is a senior in high school this year and I teach school and he attends the school where I teach. And so Paul comes to school and he's there sometimes in a wheelchair or, um, you know, he struggles and people see that. And so for Alex not to have to explain constantly, it was just, it was a, a refreshing thing to educate everybody about it and talk to people at the school. And now they just, they know. And, and so it just, it, it kind of relieved that burden of having to talk about and answer questions constantly. Socks on, I got my socks on, I got my all got socks on, I got my socks on, I got my socks on, I got my all got socks on. We've got our socks on for a very special cause. My husband Paul suffers from a disease called myotonic muscular dystrophy. One of his many challenges is that he can't put his socks on. Although it is rare, it is the most common form of adult onset muscular dystrophy. Myotonic muscular dystrophy is a neuromuscular disease that has no treatment and has no 
You can help us raise awareness by joining us in the Socks On Challenge. Find your craziest socks, post a picture with you and your family, or better yet, learn the dance. Tag us in hashtag Socks On Challenge.